Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we sang holy, holy, holy this morning. And we know that's what you are. And we come to you through the merits of Jesus Christ this morning and hopefully in the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we want to acknowledge you, and we want to say holy, 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 and we worship you this morning as the triune God. Uh, there is none like you in all of heaven, and that's why we're not supposed to make an image or a statue or anything of any likeness to try to depict who you are, uh, because that's impossible. And, uh, Father, we uh, bow our hearts this morning, and we Thank you that you bid us to come before the throne of grace. Uh, we know that we could not walk into any uh, kingly or earthly palace today and uh, speak to any uh, dignitary, uh, any king, any president. Uh, we would be uh, stopped at the gate, and yet uh, you have uh, given us access through one God and one man, uh, the mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his merits and it's in his stead that we come to you and we come clothed with his righteousness and we bless you that we have access this morning to your throne of grace. We thank you that you've given us everything in Christ uh, for life uh, daily provision, whether we see it or not, uh, we know that you promise to provide uh, for us tomorrow. Uh, as da David said, the righteous, he's never seen the righteous go hungry. And we bless you for that. Uh, may the, the, the cares of the world in this regard uh, just be cast so far from our hearts and our minds that uh, we would have peace. Uh, and that we would own that scripture. Uh, also, Lord, too, uh, there are so many that are hurting in our family, our church family this morning. Uh, Want to lift up uh, the shirt lifts and uh, the struggles that Mike has. I pray that you would give uh, uh, Carol peace as well. Uh, may the, uh, your peace be upon their hearts. Uh, and we pray that you would give Mike some strength as you've given Sandy Sherman some strength this past week. Um, also, Father, too, um, thank you for Edith Perfetti being here to morning, and this morning we bless, bless your heart that uh, you've given her the grace to be here. Um, again, we think of uh, Patricia Fogal, Fred Legler. Um, lift them up before your throne of grace. Chuck Davis, um, may you um, just richly bless them and fill their hearts. Uh, with great, great joy, uh, remind them of your, your faithfulness and your love. Also, Father, too, um, I pray that you would encourage Cindy Ellis uh, with the burdens of caring for her parents and uh, the, the pressures that she's under. And um, also, Lord, too, we want to lift up Harold uh, with uh, the knee problem that he has right now. Um, pray that um, you, would, you would touch his body and that you would bring healing to the part of his knee that is uh, giving him problems. Um, also, Lord, too, um, we pray that we would own uh, complete healing this morning in the Lord Jesus. And um, we pray that your peace would be upon our hearts, uh, especially as we... Um, our burden for our families, uh, that, uh, our loved ones that don't know you. And also, Lord, too, um, for our country. Uh, we're burdened about that as well. Uh, we know that we have a heavenly city uh, whose builder and maker is God, and yet we're, we're burdened, Lord, for our country and our communities and our families. Uh, we pray that you would... Uh, 
answer our prayers for revival, and we pray, Lord, that you would answer our prayers as we would know how to uh, reach people, uh, especially in this community, with the gospel of Christ. Uh, We thank you for this time. We pray these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Uh, we have a scripture reading. Scripture reading this morning, please. David. This morning's first scripture reading from the book of Psalms. The 103rd Psalm. Be reading the first five verses and then verses 10 through 12. I happen to know that that is on page 587 in the Red Church Bible. At least least somebody does. (laughs) The 103rd Psalm, the first five verses. And then verses 10 through 12. David writes, Praise the Lord my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our inequities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. May he add his blessing to his holy word. Our second reading this morning is from the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews, beginning in verse 11. And that's found on page 1167 of the Church Bible. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are, made, who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there's no longer any sacrifice for sin. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that my uh, words this morning uh, would be life, uh, would be your words and life to your people. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So folks, uh, several weeks ago, I uh, read an article listing uh, the many people that President Trump had pardoned in his final hours. And it was a very, very long list. And the article covered uh, who they were, what crime they committed, who supported their pardons, how they were giving back now in their confined, imprisoned state, uh, what they were planning to do to improve themselves after getting a pardon. Now, so I'm reading this article, and then I decided to read up on the presidential pardon. And I began to reflect. And I started to ask, the question, if you 
were to get a presidential pardon, what would it look like? Well, first of all, it's conditional. I want you to know that it's conditional. It only applies to federal crimes. It doesn't apply to state crimes. That's the first thing. Secondly, it doesn't apply to impeachment. So you start to see that it doesn't apply to all situations. Now, if you were to get a full pardon, that's like a get out of jail free card, right? Your, your criminal record is totally expunged. But if you were to get a commutation, your criminal record is not expunged. You just get out of prison. What happens is you're, if you had a 25 year prison sentence and you serve 10, they would let you out and say you don't have to serve the other 15. That's a commutation. And get this, if you accept the pardon, there's still the question of whether you admit guilt or not. Did you know that? I found that very interesting. Uh, President Ford, when he acquitted President um, Nixon, he said by Nixon accepting the pardon, Nixon admitted to his guilt. But George H.W. Bush, when he um, pardoned Casper Weinberger, Secretary of Defense for the Iran-Contra affair, President Bush said he wasn't guilty. He didn't admit to guilt because he was just doing the right thing. So the, the question of guilt is, is up in the air. It hasn't been decided by the courts. Furthermore, you should know that presidential pardons have been very politicized. Now, there are people who don't have any political clout who uh, are graciously given this pardon. But it is largely a political process. Here's something else I didn't know. Do you know that there is an office of pardon that exists among the White House staff? And these decisions, again, they're very political, but the staff reviews and, 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 and all these things that come across the desk, requests that come across the desk, and then they make recommendations to the presidential advisors. And then the presidential advisors go in and they make recommendations to the president. And here's the thing, the president doesn't have to grant the pardon. Uh, he could look the other way. Who was that guy, uh, the Tiger King? Uh, I can't think of uh, the guy that was in prison. He's in prison for trying to kill his wife. And he's a Trump supporter. And so he, he thought he was going to get a presidential pardon because he said, Mr. President, I'm a Trump supporter. Well, he pulls the limousine, he has a limousine come up to the prison, and he's, it's running and they're waiting to let him out, and he never got the pardon. So the president doesn't have to pardon you. And here's the other problem, though. When you get this pardon, you ever hear the expression, the elephant never forgets? In the reality in the world of politics, many people get a presidential pardon, but people don't forget. They don't forget that you were a criminal. Uh, people are still screaming about Bill Clinton's pardons from 25, 20, 25 years ago. That some of the people that he pardoned. And last month they were screaming about people that Donald Trump pardoned. You see, so people don't forget, do they? And, and, and so sometimes you carry this label forever. But now, I ask you this other question. What if you were to get a pardon from God? It's not conditional. It's unconditional. In Jesus Christ, it's unconditional. God doesn't say, well, it doesn't apply to impeachment or all situations. When you come to Jesus Christ, it's a pardon for all situations. It's all sin, past, present, and future. Once justified before God, as you know, you read the book of Romans. You can't work for it. It becomes a debt. You can't work for salvation. You say, well, Pastor, uh, well, why does it talk about the saints being judged? Well, the saints are being judged based on loss of rewards or rewards gained. But we're not on the same foundation or platform as the unbeliever. The unbeliever is judged in their sin. We're, we're judged in Christ. There's a huge difference. Huge, huge difference. And you can't lose your salvation.
Here's the other thing, too. God doesn't have a staff that kind of reviews this. Now, this is the other thing I found out. You know, a staff, they have lobbyists. People lobby. You know, here we go. Um, Annie Harris. I want Annie Harris to get pardoned. So I, I lobby, and I get Bob Ganaway, and I get Mark, and I get Carol Cor and I get all these people together and say, yeah, yeah, Annie's a good person. She should be pardoned. She's doing some great things in prison. She's going to do great things when she gets out. Sorry, Annie. Okay. Yeah, but you never talked to Ann. <laughs> God's subject to none of that. None of that. He doesn't play the political game. Doesn't do it. Never will do it. He doesn't show favoritism. Does, it's not about... You know, how much money you have? He doesn't say, well, let me see, uh, did they donate money to my political campaign? Are they a Republican or are they a Democrat? Were they do-gooders when they got in, before they got in trouble? Were they do-gooders in prison? Do they have the capacity to do good when they get out? How does this help our party's cause? Uh, or what kind of political statement does this make? God says none of that. Just as I am. You come to the cross, you come to Christ. And it's a full pardon. It's either all or none. God does not commute sin. He doesn't say, you know, like, well, it, it's just kind of halfway. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll, forget, we'll forget your sins in the past, but we're not going to forget them in the, pre in, in the future. Uh, it doesn't work that way. As the songwriter says, my sin, not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. And so in God's court, sin is forgiven, period. Uh, Jeremiah says, 33 verse 8, I will remember their sins no more. Amen? And yet, here's the reality. In the world of human nature, just like you have people politically that never forget. Human nature is such that we don't forget. Many people, many, many people are burdened and bent low. They carry sin and guilt around and they don't have to do so. It doesn't have to be that way. They don't have the freedom in Christ. They don't have the freedom from sin. They don't have the freedom from guilt. I see, you know, you've seen people, they just like, look like they have the weight of the world on their shoulders. I mean, they're physically hunched. They're mentally hunched. They're spiritually hunched over. They're just, they're just so burdened. And it doesn't have to be that way. But there's basically two reasons for this. One is that they have not come to Jesus Christ and asked for forgiveness of sin. They're not born again. They do not know the power of the resurrected life in Christ. The second reason for carrying the weight is that they have come to Christ. They know that their sins are forgiven. But they have not experienced a full release from guilt that comes with sin. I have talked to believers. In fact, I was one of those believers at one point that just couldn't get rid of the guilt. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's human nature, we don't forget. Where there is sin, there is guilt. You see it with Adam and Eve in the garden, right? And, and so, some people are tormented by it, hunched over in life in all forms and fashions, and others suppress it. And they go along, and they never question anything. They just keep on pushing it down and down and down. And ultimately, it's going to make you sick. It'll make you sick. It's like, you know, the sin has been committed 30 years ago, and yet the guilt just kind of comes up like fresh cream every morning in the dairy, you know? And so sin has to be dealt with, obviously at the cross, but the guilt has to be dealt with as well. And that comes at the cross too, but for whatever reason, the elephant never forgets. Let me give you a little bit of history here if I can. In the Old Testament, 
there were two sacrificial offerings that went hand in hand, and they, fe they fell under the, what we call the expiatory, expiatory sacrifice or the make, make atonement sacrifice. Basically, it was an offering for sin and for guilt, but it was two separate offerings. And so one offering was for the actual sin, and the other one was for the actual guilt. Now, when guilt was incurred with sin, sometimes restitution was made. And there were all sorts of sacrifices for other stuff as well, which we won't get into now. But when you come to the New Testament, what do you have? You have one sacrifice to make atonement for sin and guilt. It's a, it's a one size that fits all. You know, you go and you buy socks and it's a, it says one size fits all. It's kind of simple, right? Uh, and so what we have here is the blood of Christ, one sacrifice, and it's eternal, according to Hebrews 10. Uh, we don't need a sacrifice for sin, and we don't need a sacrifice for guilt, and we don't need one for jealousy, and we don't need another one for a peace offering, or purification, or consecration, or deconsecration, or thanksgiving, or one for a blessing. Uh, they, they brought all those sacrifices in the old, I mean, many, many sacrifices. And yet God gives us a one-size-fits-all through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it completely removes the sin and the guilt. So why is it that we keep on taking it? I mean, he offers us a full pardon, the get-out-of-jail-free card, etch-a-sketch, and yet we, we take it like, oh, he's only commuted our sentence. We, we walk around with it. Can, can, let me ask you this. If Jesus were standing here right now, do you think he would say to you, your sin is forgiven, but keep the guilt? That's not the God I know, right? So why is it that we carry it? Whatever he does, he doesn't do it halfway, he does it fully, and he does it perfectly. Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, I will remember your sins no more. This is linear. It's the idea of infinity. I may have talked about that a year and a half, two years ago. But infinity is the picture of fullness and perfection. It's complete. And yet there's just one problem. It's you and it's me. We don't forget. We, we beat ourselves up well enough on our own. I don't need a political foe. It's self-flagellation. Do you ever see where, you know, when the Muslims, get, they beat themselves. People used to beat themselves in medieval days too, you know, beat themselves into submission. But it's self-flagellation. It's like the spiritual ball and chain. You know, you, you, you get the, you, the thing, you just drag the spiritual ball and chain around. You know, in the, in the, in some of the, in the old, in the pictures, you know, a couple hundred years ago, they would have this big iron ball with the chain and the guy would be in prison and, you know, deep, dark, dungy prison and he'd drag the ball. Well, we, we drag this spiritual ball and chain around. You know, it's, it's, it's self-flagellation. It's like, you know, we're doing some sort of penance or something. I've got to do something um, for God because uh, to get rid of my sin or whatever. And people actually try to work for it. Ironically, isn't this what some people are putting our country through? Think about this. National self-flagellation. America's bad. America had a history of racism. That was sinful. Hold on to your guilt and your shame. Shame yourself. My goodness, I didn't even know the people 250 years ago that lived at that time. I mean, my, my relatives were immigrants. They came over, I think, in like, you know, before the, you know, the turn of the 19th century, 20th century, 1900s. I mean, you know, maybe like the late 1880s or something, I don't know. There is no longer any institution of slavery. The guilt should be gone with the sin. 
With the slavery, it's gone. That's a picture of full redemption. You don't drag it around. And But the flogging and the beating continues as if there's some sort of racial penance that has to be done. It's insane. It just opens scars. You know what I, you know what I found long, long ago? You get a splinter, right? You pick it out. And sometimes when they're really deep, it hurts like the dickens, right? You get, I, mean, I got a question for you. When you get it out, do you keep on picking at it? That's insane, right? That leads to more infection, more scar tissue. It's the worst case scenario. It just brings more pain and suffering. Isn't it, isn't it crazy what people have been doing to our nation? Isn't it crazy what we do to ourselves? If you saw somebody beating themselves because they were so burdened from their sin, what would you tell them? <laughs> Stop. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. Uh, there's a time for everything under the sun. And there's a time to move on. There's a time to forgive and forget. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ does. And we need to learn to do that. In our churches, with ourselves, in our communities, in our country. Now, here's the other problem. Of course, it doesn't help when you have an adversary, the devil, that throws everything in the kitchen sink at you. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy, keep you down, keep you chained up, keep you tw confused and twisted, keep you in bondage, keep you ineffective in the things of Christ, keep you from laboring and ministering. Oh, I, Pastor, I could never do that. I, I, I'm just not good enough to serve. If we say that we're not good enough, then the very thing that Christ did to make us worthy to serve, we're suggesting that is unworthy. If you say, I'm not worthy enough, then you're saying that Christ has not made you worthy. And what does that say about his sacrifice? You know, I learned a long time ago, when I carry the guilt, I am defeated. I live a defeated life. And that's not a good place to be as a believer. And that's the work of the devil. The devil will say to you, hold on to your guilt, you worthless sinner. It's okay. Your sin's forgiven, but you've got to hold on to it. And that's nothing more and nothing less than enslavement. You know, uh, you know that people can be enslaved financially, right? It's called being in debt. It's being owned by the way, folks, that's the modern form of slavery today. That's what we should be talking about. How many Americans are financially in debt, filing bankruptcy, can't pay their bills? If you knew anything about history, the Founding Fathers warned about that, didn't they? They warned about the banks getting in and fleecing the country. What did Ben Franklin say? Borrower nor lender be. Read about the Federal Reserve. Read about the banking system and you will know all you need to know about why we are a country in debt. You, you'll, know, you, you'll know everything about what happened this past election. Because they were right behind it. You will understand the whys of the current social structure and you will understand why we're turning to socialism. Read about the banking system. People are also enslaved spiritually as well. And that's the hidden form of slavery, right? Carrying a spiritual debt, not realizing that it's been paid in full, or not experiencing the realization of the freedom that Christ wants to bring. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I, are you free today? I'm free. I'm free. I don't carry it anymore. I don't. Do I feel badly of mistakes and things I should have or shouldn't have done? Sure. 
but I don't carry the guilt anymore. God does that for me. Knowing him is the key to being released from the spiritual bondage in prison. Knowing the fullness of his work at Calvary is the antidote to the hidden tyranny that binds our hearts. And only then will it lead us to a freedom in him. And you have to own that. And, and I would encourage you to make it a prayer. If you don't own that, then you make it a prayer. So I, 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 I close. Are, are you carrying any sin and guilt this morning? Or are you carrying just guilt? The guilt of sin? If so, God wants you to be free. And it comes through Jesus Christ. Uh, it is finished. It is done. Done at the cross. No questions asked. You bury the guilt along with the sin. You don't pick it up. Uh, it is his to carry forever. Amen? It's his forever. That's, uh, that's what I have to share this morning. Uh, let's transition uh, this morning to communion by singing uh, our next song, hymn number 492 at Calvary. 492 at Calvary. Please stand.